Hello, viewers. Let's brew makgeolli. Let's brew some delicious Korean rice wine. Nuruk is an essential ingredient of makgeolli. And this is Jinju Gokja Nuruk, which, which is a good brand. So I'm measuring 200 grams of Jinju Gokja Nuruk here. And let's talk about a two-stage fermentation. When should the Nuruk be added? So at least some Nuruk should be added at the start, otherwise fermentation can't even begin. So I could add all the Nuruk in the first stage, which is what I normally do. But another possibility is to split the Nuruk between the first and second stages. So that's what I'm going to test today. And if you keep watching, you're going to see me recover from a big problem. So watch out for that. So here's my brewing plan today. Two-stage brews, Eongju, first stage Juke, and second stage Godubab. Jar A is going to be my normal recipe, where all the Nuruk is in the first stage. And for Jar B, Nuruk is going to be split evenly between the first and second stages. So let's see how this turns out. The first thing I want to show you is that splitting the Nuruk between stages is an acceptable thing to do. There are historical recipes like this, and there are also recipes for commercial brewing that uh, split the Nuruk between stages. So first I'll show you in, uh, in this reference book, Makali and Yakju, Science and Application. Here's a recipe for Takju that's for uh, 100 kilograms of rice in total and 9 kilograms of Nuruk. This happens to be a three-stage recipe with one kilogram of Nuruk in the first stage, four kilograms in the second stage, and another four kilograms in the third stage. And here's a historical recipe. This one uh, was written down in 1827. This is something called Nokpaju. Okay, there seems to be several ways to make it, but for uh, the third way here, this is where you can see there's two editions of Nuruk. Even if you can't read the whole thing, this character is is for Nuruk, Chu, Chinese character. And uh, here's, here's the first edition of uh, five units of uh, Nuruk powder. And then this is the second edition uh, a week later of seven units of Nuruk powder. So I just wanted to show that I'm not out of line by adding the Nuruk in multiple stages. It, it's okay to do this. So let's get back to brewing. I've measured my Nuruk, and I'm going to put it in the sun. So I've opened the door here, and I just have the screen, and I have direct sunlight shining on the Nuruk. This is the Bapche method. Literally, it's sort of the standard thing you're supposed to do. It's the standard thing you're supposed to do. G give the Nuruk some sun. It likes it. You know, freshen it up a bit. Wake it up. And it should produce a good brew if you do this. And as the Nuruk is in the sun, I'm going to be measuring out some rice flour here. 400 grams. And adding 1.6 liters of water. And then I'll stir this and make juke. So this is quite a bit of juke, and it's going to take 22 minutes to st of continuous stirring to make this juke. And it is important to, to stir. You don't want it sticking to the bottom and burning. You want it cooked evenly. So the purpose of my channel is for more people to know about rustic Asian rice wine. I want people to appreciate drinking it. I want people to know how to make it. And I think it's a really effective way to teach people by showing them on YouTube. And if you want to help me out, all you have to do is the usual, like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video wherever it is appropriate. You can help me out in my goal just by telling people about this channel and uh, you know sharing your love of Makali. So I appreciate your help. And I really do want people to know how uh, how easy it is to brew makgeolli in your kitchen. You don't, you don't need a lot of equipment. It's a forgiving recipe, and it should work. Buy the ingredients, follow some instructions. You can, you can make delicious Korean rice wine. So uh, now it's been more than 20 minutes, and it's thickening up. And I'm just going to make sure it is cooked all the way through. It's evenly cooked. It ends up looking lumpy, 
but that's that's fine. It, I was stirring the whole time, so I know those aren't uh, uncooked lumps. Those are fine. Now, this volume of juke, juke means porridge, this volume of porridge is going to take a while to cool down. So I'm putting it in an ice bath. And as I'm waiting for the juke to cool down, I can bring in my nuruk from the sun. This is the 200 grams of nuruk. And these chunks are a bit large. I want the nuruk to be more powdery. So I'm going to grind it up a bit. And I'm going to measure out 100 grams of nuruk. That's for, uh, that's for jar A. And I'm going to measure out 50 grams of nuruk for jar B at the start. And I'm going to save the rest, which is 50 grams, for later for jar B. So I'm saving the nuruk in the plastic bag for another day. For the rest of the nuruk, I'm going to soak in water for an hour or two. And for jar A, I'm adding 200 milliliters of water to that 100 grams of nuruk. And I'm going to use half a teaspoon of this Bexul Doga yeast. This is the yeast from Pek Joan Wan, celebrity chef. And uh, for the 50 grams of nuruk, I'm adding 100 milliliters of water and the, by the same amount of, uh, of yeast, half a teaspoon of yeast. And the nuruk in the bag is for the second stage. Mix the juke every so often. It's really thick now that it's cooled down, but make sure it's uh, cooled down evenly. And I'm going to use the scale to divide it in two. And I was able to do that because I pre-weighed the pot and the wooden spatulas. I, I know how much everything weighs, so I can divide the juke into two equal parts. So I'm going to use this juke for jar A, and this needs to be stirred well. This needs to be incorporated well. So I'm stirring this for 10 minutes. If you skimp on stirring, you'll have some rice that doesn't touch any nuruk and it won't uh, ferment as well. So, And also the more you stir this, the more liquid is going to be. The enzymes are already starting to work and uh, liquefy the porridge. So the, the more you can stir, the better. It just, it does, uh, it is a bit strenuous to do this. Oh, 10 minutes is fine, though. So that's for jar A. This is the first stage for jar A. And I've done this recipe before, so uh, I'm confident this is going to ferment well. But I want to compare it with, uh, with jar B. So clean up the jar, put the lid on loosely to allow some airflow, and let's let's look at jar B now. So uh, same amount of juke that's cooled, and this is a uh, but this is now half the amount of nuruk. And again, I'm going to need to mix this, incorporate that nuruk into the porridge. Uh, so I'm going to have to mix this for at least ten minutes. But it is softer, and I'll be able to scrape that into jar B. Yeah, you can see the juke is thicker than what I what I was able to put into jar A. But that's fine. Clean it up, and the other 50 grams of nuruk I'll put in stage two, and just put away the jars to ferment in a relatively cool place out of direct sunlight. Okay, let's see what it looks like the next morning. And it is very quiet. I'm not hearing any bubbles. There's some remnants of some bubbles, but uh, that's those... Yeah, it's, it's not fermenting. 
There's no yeast activity visible. So this is a big problem. So it's time for a test. If you've watched my other videos, you know that I try to give advice to relax and to let the fermentation proceed at its own pace. But no bubbling is really an emergency, and I need to do something about it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to proof this yeast. Is, is this yeast actually still good? I'm going to take warm water, add the yeast to the warm water, and also a pinch of sugar. I'm going to stir that and uh, cover it and wait an hour. And come back in an hour and uh, uh, so there are a few bubbles, but that's not good. It, it really should look like this. So goodbye, Hick Jung Wan. I have other yeast. I can use this white wine yeast in this unopened package. It should be good. So that Pictron Juan yeast, uh, the Pixel Doga yeast, it was expired going by the date on the on the container, but uh, I was hoping it would still work. But since it didn't, I'm switching to the to the wine yeast. So this is another hundred milliliters of water with yeast split between the two jars. That's not a big deal. I just need to get this fermentation started. So I split the yeast water between the two jars, and then I'm going to stir both the jars. And you can see that jar A is more liquid than jar B. So using less Nuruk does affect the behavior. But then 12 hours later, later that same day, now the fermentation really is going. I can hear all kinds of bubbles. That's more like it. So now I don't have to worry. Fermentation has started. So stir both of those again. Now day two. Take a look. And it there are so many rapid bubbles. I'm really hearing a lot of bubbles now. Yeah, totally different, and uh, ev and from the side too, you can tell that uh, fermentation is occurring, and, and both of them are totally liquid now. Very easy to stir. Then on day three, you can even see layers, and there's, I'm I'm hearing lots of bubbles. The top layer is clear now. So the yeast. This first stage, the purpose of the first stage here is so that the yeast reproduces. So we should have the maximum amount of yeast now. And because we have all that yeast, we want to feed that yeast. And we're going to make godobop. We're going to feed the yeast the godobop, and uh, it'll be able to make some alcohol. So we're going to feed the yeast some godobop. Well, I indirectly. The godobop goes in. It's converted to sugar by the enzymes in the new root, and uh, the yeast will convert that into alcohol. Of course, we need to wash the rice. Then soak the rice for at least three hours, and then drain the rice. And this is sweet rice, of course. The best kind of rice to use for godubap. Put it in the steamer, in the cloth, cover it up, and uh, yeah. Okay, what, I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to steam it for 40 minutes. And then I unwrap the cloth, and I'm going to turn over all of the rice. I want to everything to be cooked evenly, so I'm going to turn over all the rice, cover it up again, 
Turn off the heat and let it sit there for another 10 minutes. And that's just to ensure even cooking. I don't want any overcooked or undercooked spots of the rice. I want everything evenly cooked. So now I can take the rice out. Um, and I am doing something different here. What I have are these silicone mats. Now the rice tends to stick to the cloth a bit and it should stick less to these silicone mats. So I'm going to spread it out on the mats. Hopefully that makes things easier to clean later. And of course I have a link in the description where you can find these kinds of silicone mats. But for now I just want to spread out the rice and let it cool. And basically it should cool to room temperature, but um, the important thing is to cool it down to below 30 degrees Celsius. And as it's cooling down, I cover it with another damp cloth. This is a cloth I, I also steamed. And that's so the rice doesn't dry out. Now I can take the 50 grams of Nuruk that I was saving and add 100 milliliters of water. Let that soak as the gotubap is cooling. And that'll be for jar B. And I just need to split the rice evenly between the two jars, and I'll use the, the scale for that. And since the first stage has settled into two layers, I will stir it before I add the rice. And with the scale, it's not too hard to get it divided exactly evenly. And then I add the additional nuruk to jar B. And then of course, I mix each of the jars by hand. So, of course, every grain of rice needs to be separated and uh, incorporated into the first stage, which is very liquid. And the gotubap will, of course, soak up the liquid quite quickly. So, um, again, the lids are loose, and uh, I can put it back in the cabinet to ferment. And the next day, yes, the nuruk has soaked up all the liquid. It might look dry, and that's fine, because on the next day, day five, you can see that liquid is already collecting on the bottom. See day six, day seven, and it does look like jar A is a bit ahead in terms of fermentation progress. The liquid collects, but then rice starts falling from the top down to the bottom. Even on day 11, dry still looks a little bit ahead. You can see the progress every day of fermentation here. Now, this, now you might think, oh, the this liquid layer is pretty low down. There's not enough liquid. Well, don't uh, don't worry. You'll see in the end it's all going to turn out. As the days go on, you can see that liquid layer is rising. Then by day 19, the rice is broken down. So let's just watch that fermentation sequence again every day from day four onward. And you can see that liquid layer rise higher and higher. And in fact, by the end, you can see that jar B looks perfectly fine. It's not behind at all. In fact, it looks more fermented than jar A. So uh, day 19, it's time to filter I'm going to use my large filter bag today just to try something different. How's this large bag going to work out? I, I often use bags that are pretty small and are just the minimum size necessary in order for me to filter one of these jars. And this bag, this filter bag, um, is much larger. Um, it's overly large, but it's actually, actually more convenient. Uh, Turns out to be easier to squeeze. Yeah, this, that was one of the easiest filterings I've I've done that I can remember. So the leftovers from that filtering, the jigami, that's that's uh, two hundred and twenty three grams. I want to do a bonus bowl, so I take that 
take that jigami, put it back in the filter bag, and add 200 milliliters of water, and uh, squish it around a lot, and uh, re-squeeze it, because there was still plenty of flavor and alcohol in that jigami, and I'd bring it down from uh, 223 to 182 grams. And that's my bonus bowl. I'll enjoy that today. I boil my filter bag again, and then I'm ready to do jar B. And again, uh, jar B, very easy to squeeze the uh, liquid through the filter bag. That worked very well. And... Uh, End up with pretty much the same amount of jiggy meat, 217 grams. And again, uh, another two liters of, of uh, output here. Now I want the jar B bonus bowl. I put that uh, jiggy meat back in the filter bag, add the 200 milliliters of water, and uh, re squeeze, re filter. So that's some real makli right there, real fresh makli. And uh, the jigami goes down to 183 grams. So in the end, this uh, here's the jigami summary. In the end, jar A and jar B are pretty much the same. Okay, now I can taste these bonus bowls. Um, these bonus bowls, they are diluted quite a bit. So they, they do taste a bit thin. They do have plenty of flavor, though. They're, they're tart and astringent. They have some sour and a bil- bit uh, milky aroma. Um, I would say these are like semi-dry, not particularly sweet. You can d- just detect some sweetness. The, mo- the most mass-produced makgeolli has uh, less flavor than these uh, bonus bowls. So just something to keep in mind. It's one of the reasons why it's so good to make your own makgeolli at home. But as always, uh, it is worthwhile to put it in the fridge, and wait a bit, compare it. I'm going to wait three days and uh, taste it then. So it's been three days. Let's have a taste. But before we taste, let's look to see how uh, these bottles have settled. Um, Looks like they've settled exactly the same. This is about one quarter sediment. The sediment seems pretty soft. And the uh, the bottles are pliable, so uh, yeah, there's no carbonation. And it's, they fermented a fairly long time, so that's expected. Um, and the Changju layer, the clear layer, is um, a little cloudy, so I'm going to taste the Changju for A first. So again, A is the um, is the recipe with all the nuruk at the beginning, and then B has it timed so that nuruk is added equally in each of the two stages. This is Changju for A, and quite fruity aroma, and also since it's fresh. You can really smell the alcohol. A bit of a grassy aroma too. So it smells very fresh. So quite a bite at the beginning. Just a small amount of sweetness. The end is more nutty. Fairly astringent aftertaste. Yeah, more nutty than milky. Okay, so that's A. So here's B. Okay, so A and B. Hmm. So the aroma might be more, more grassy, less, um, less fruity. Similar punch at the beginning. A lot of flavor at the beginning here. Yeah, um, so a, a bit tart. Both of them, both of them are tart. Okay, but similar levels, very similar flavor. 
maybe less nutty aftertaste. But pretty nice. So both of these have plenty of alcohol. They are very similar. B might be a little grassier. Yeah, that's all I would say. Okay, but I need to uh, taste the, um, I need to taste the mixed up as Takchu. Um, this is always a little confusing, but uh, the, the clear layer, I call it Changju. Um, if you sell it, it's called Yakchu. And the bottom, uh, bottom is called Takchu because it's, it's cloudy. Now if I mix the whole thing up, so this is A, let's, uh, let's mix this up. Since it's only uh, been three days since bottling, it's easy to mix it completely. Now this is Takchu. So before only the bottom was Takchu, now this whole thing is Takchu. Uh, the whole thing is cloudy wine. This is undiluted cloudy wine. But uh, another another word to refer to this as the mixture of the of everything that was brewed is wanju, which is just original wine. This, so this is the complete brewed wine mixed together. And just because it's it is cloudy now, this whole thing is uh, is a takju. Okay, so this is recipe A. Wanju. Okay, and more of a milky aroma. A bit of sweetness. I don't even know if you can smell sweetness, but this smells more like sweet milk. Bit of citrus smell. Mix up B. Pour recipe B, Wanju. So now I have A and B. Okay, similar aroma. He might be a little stronger aroma. Okay, more astringency, more of a mineral finish. Yeah, with both of them, more of a mineral finish. Generally, this plays out to my expectations of a Yangju, a two-stage brew. Does the timing of the Nuruk make a difference in the flavor? I I don't think so. It it did affect how the fermentation looked and uh, maybe on different scales that would be significant because that is, um, so I think that is the pattern that I noticed. If you're brewing a larger quantity, so when I looked at some of these historical recipes, for example, the, the quantities are much larger and uh, it's more, it's it's convenient to add the Nuruk in stages as the same as the stages of rice. Uh, if you're doing a, a small brew, it, just in a small jar, it, it's more convenient just to prepare all the Nuruk on the same day and add it in the beginning. So even though adding the Nuruk in stages along with the rice in stages in some ways might provide a more uniform fermentation experience um, for, I think for a small brew like I'm doing in a small jar, it's not going to make a difference in the end product. Um, but it's the kind of thing you do need to be concerned about if you're doing it in larger quantities. So if you're doing it in larger quantities, uh, I, I would experiment with adding the new root in stages uh, it might help keep things balanced uh, overall as the fermentation progresses. It, it's always a good thing to keep things uh, balanced. Don't have things swing too much one way or the other. You don't want extremes of, of temperature or of sugar concentration. You don't want everything to happen at the same time. So um, I can see that adding new root in stages is a is a way to keep things in balance if uh, if there's a tendency to go for things to go out of whack, but uh, for for my small brews and these small jars, um, it's probably not necessary. Uh, might as well stick with the convenience of of 
preparing the new rug all on the same day at the beginning. You know, if you have a sunny day, you can do the babche method and, and put the new rug in the sun. Uh, you don't want to have to coordinate the the sunshine on on two or or on multiple days. It's better just to have to do it once and uh, prepare the new rug and soak it. Um, yeah, it's just easier for uh, logistically to do that once. And uh, yeah, so in in general, that's I'm sure that's what I'm going to continue to do. Uh, but if I do uh, extra large brew, I will consider uh, uh, putting the nuruk in several stages. So uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's my conclusion from this experiment. Uh, the results are both good; they have plenty of flavor, and they're not they're not different from one another. So it's not a difference in flavor. You're getting a slight difference in the fermentation process. That's all. So uh, hope you found this interesting. Let me know what you're brewing in the comments. I always want to hear what you're up to. Uh, are you fermenting anything else? Are you are you uh, concentrating on brewing makali? Well, whatever you're doing, let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching.